Well, good morning. How are you? It's good to see you in the church today, some of you. It's a great blessing to come into God's house. Uh, even though we're not all together yet as a congregation, I, I know that you should know that you represent at least 20 or 30 people, each of you do, and I just want to commend you for your faithfulness. I knew you were going to be okay. I knew that Lord would take care of you in every, in every respect, and uh, we look forward to the time we can assemble in the fullness of the congregational worship as God has blessed us so faithfully and mightily in the past days. I do appreciate our Board of Deacons and their care for you and uh, following the guidelines, and I appreciate your adherence to that um, as we press on through some very uh, unusual times in our world today, and I don't have to tell you that, but it's good to know that we serve a God that does not change, and I pray that uh, as we change, that it's for the better. I think I've noticed that in my personal life, relationship with God, and I trust you have too. It's amazing how God blesses us uh, to draw closer to him when it seems to hurt so much in every other way. But may the Lord bless us to rejoice. And thank you again for being here today as we embrace the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and worship him, endeavor to at least in spirit and in truth. Thank you for your prayers and, and all your thoughts in Christ Jesus. Uh, I know that you've noticed the announcements uh, particularly the prayer list on the uh, scroll here on the, on the video, but I, I wanted to bring you up today on a couple maybe that weren't there that had not had time to be there. I talked to Brother Arthur Woodrum yesterday, and he was down at Memorial Hospital. So to Mary Alice, his wife is there, and she had been in a rehab and just had a real tough day and the day before, and they took her over to Memorial Hospital. And so uh, Brother Arthur wanted me to tell you, the congregation, or ask you to continually pray for her and pray for him uh, through this uh, really tough journey they're going through, as you know, with her health. But I uh, just wanted you to know about that. And also I uh, found out uh, that uh, Brother Freddie Tucker passed away and be in prayer for the family, Sister Sue and family, and also um, uh, the family of Alice Groover. Uh, be in prayer for that family as well. Um, I don't know if this breaks the rules and standards of social distancing or not, but I just got to do it. Uh, uh, but Jonathan, would, would you and Elizabeth please stand up? I know we're in a situation. These two young people uh, decided to get married. And so they were engaged, and we just want to tell you from the church family, although we're not here all yet, to embrace you, that we just uh, bid you Godspeed, and may the Lord bless you, and keep you real close to it. May the Lord bless you very much. Would you bow with me then for a prayer together? Dear most precious Heavenly Father, it's good to come into your house. We come, Lord, wanting to glorify your holy name. We thank you, Lord, for preserving your word and the truth that it represents. We know, Lord, that we're still walking on shaking ground, seems like, and there seems to be still a lot of fear around, and some of it probably is uncalled for, and yet some of it, Lord, is, is with good common sense that we, we view the situation and we want to, Lord, conduct ourselves in a way that we are to protect our physical health, and yet you are the great physician. The reason we want to do that, Lord, is to always serve you the best we can. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would accept our thanks for your protection and watch care over us. I thank, Lord, it goes without saying this church family and friends have been protected through in this pandemic era. And we realize there's many who have not. We realize, too, Lord, as we bow in this comfort of this sanctuary and Go to homes to, that has food in the, in the pantries and on the stove probably. Uh, there's a lot of people that's hurting. A lot of people don't have any. A lot of people that's grieving loss of loved ones. And so, Lord, we don't, we don't high, hold any standard above that. We understand the seriousness of the situation. And we just thank you, Lord, for your mercy and we pray now as we endeavor to open the doors of the church at least, endeavor to worship you again here. 
as an organization publicly that you would bless us to do that. We ask you to bless especially those that are here. They're so faithful, and I know they love you so much. And I pray that you'd bless their homes and families and their vocations and all they do. And remember those, so many of them, Lord, that want to be here today. And I think by knowing that some are here and they're not able to come yet, probably makes them want to even more. And I pray that you'd comfort them and give them grace. I pray, O oh Lord, that you would help us to know we appreciate those that have been so faithful on Facebook and the internet ministry here at this church and for those that it made it possible that it's shown that way. We know, Lord, that there's no walls that holds us from God and we just thankful every opportunity we have to share the great gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the interest in your word and for the hunger and thirst after righteousness it seems to be in the world that we're living. We ask you now, Lord, to bless this time of service. Help me, Lord, proclaim your word. Bless, O oh Lord, your Holy Spirit to give it impact and power and substance. Lord, we just thank you for saving us from our sins. Pure and simple. Forgiving us, Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's all we need. Thank you for this beautiful Lord's Day. May you receive much honor and glory today in ever, whatever means that might be. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Well, I want to talk to you this morning about the riches of revival. It may be that I kind of want to stay on this for a few Sundays, but I believe that we are in a revival. I, I think we have been for some time now. I, I think that we miss it sometime. We become so desensitized by the world and situations and circumstances that we do miss what God is doing. Frankly, I can't believe that somebody could realize they're saved by God's amazing grace and not be in revival. I really can't understand that. Because really when you think what God has done for us and to us, it's a great blessing. I want to go though and ask you to turn there with me to the Old Testament book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 8. I'm going to use some verses there to, uh, to help us realize three things. I hope we can pull this out of God's Word. One is that God gives us clear instructions on how to live how to walk by faith, and to loving, and to practice, put that into practice in everyday life. I want to say, too, that as we see from this book, that, that we see that oftentimes with those instructions, there comes inconvenience, inconvenience. Uh, we are a people that I think are so affluent that we don't really like inconvenience. Uh, we, we don't, and, and I don't either, and, and we just, that what? I mean, we, we probably won't hear, though, after where we've been, too many people today complain about whether it's too hot or too cold in the church. Um, we, you know, you might not be so seriously wanting to leave so quick that you think it's a long sermon. I'm not going to try to do that, I promise you. I know we're not doing any singing, so I'm not going to try to take advantage of that and preach longer. I'm not. What I'm trying to say, though, that, that God gives us inconveniences to see, to show us his convenience. And I don't think until we get there, and I think it's very validated in the situation that we've been in, that the inconveniences has caused us to realize how fragile life is and how much we really do depend on God. Now, and I don't, I don't, that's go without saying. That's not something that's profound that, that I've said. You know that, and that's a blessing. So we see instructions, we see inconvenience, but I think overall, and this is the riches of revival in my view, is the interest in God. I'm talking about a sincere interest. Because I think our interest have, has vitally changed through this thing. And I want us to see the good out of all of it, okay? I can't help it if it's political. I can't help it what we think about the decisions that our governors or our president or whoever makes. Uh, we're living under God, okay, and, and we are God's people, and, and what matters in the riches of revival is understanding not what the world bends to, but what are we doing, how are we living our lives, uh, how are we appreciating what God has done for us in his service and gracious, gracious way. Well, in the book of Nehemiah, uh, you know, the first seven chapters of Nehemiah are about rebuilding the wall. So, so, you know, Nehemiah was impressed by God because 
Jerusalem's walls have been torn down, and he gets the decree, you know, and all that. And it happens because the walls were built back, and they did it in 52 days. And it's amazing. We studied that, you remember, several years ago, how the walls were built about 52 days. And the reason was the people had a mind to work. And you know what? We need to be people that have a mind to work. Not to work for our salvation because we can't do that. But we work because of it. We work because of it. And that's the great blessing that God gives us to rejoice in the riches of revival that we see that what he's done for us and to us. So now in in chapter 8 through the last part of Nehemiah is about the restoration of the people. And that's why it's kind of hung on me to give this lesson or help me. Maybe I I think I need it more than anybody in this room. But I think it does set, you know, it it applies to us today in so many ways. And, And I think what these people are doing in Nehemiah's day, once they got the wall built, they still have some inner work to do. So they remembered what God said years and years ago. And I think that's what we got to do. We want to get back to what God said to do. I think, I think until we do that, we won't really be able to appreciate the riches of revival. Okay? And so I think that the, the Lord would bless us to see that, and I pray that he will. I want to start reading in verse 13 of Nehemiah 8. It says there, and on the second day were gathered together the chief of the fathers of all the people, the priests and the Levites, unto Ezra the scribe, even to understand the words of the law. Now, the people had dispersed. Um, they, had, they had read, the book was read to them, and Ezra uh, stood up, made a platform to swear preaching, and it gave the sense in verse 8, just jumping up a little. So they read the book in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. And mainly that's because it's not because these people didn't understand the word so much, is, is that it was in Hebrew. And, and now they were in Aramaic and they were, they were transferred so they can understand it in, in their language. And so they understood that. Uh, and they proclaimed this as a holy day, okay? And, and so the Levites sealed the people, and all the people went, in verse 12, to eat and drink and send portions, and to make great mirth, because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. See, that's revival. The riches of God's book should be the catalyst of our revival, the Word of God, the Scripture. All right, now, in verse 13, here's the leaders, the scribes and the Leaders of the homes, they're staying, and, and here's what they found. See, when you stay with God's Word, you're going to find a treasure, a richness in your, in your life. That's why we need to dig in God's Word, okay? It's amazing to me in my little knowledge of God's Word how much I seem to find just reading God's Word. It's treasures, this book, and it's riches that we see that. So in verse 14, and they found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded by Moses that the children of Israel shall dwell in booths in the feast of the seventh month. Now that's the feast of the tabernacle. Feast of the tabernacle is the great ingathering of the people where they celebrated the crops and the harvest. And, and there's a feast, and we have a feast because the Christ that we serve, the Lord Jesus Christ, He has set a bountiful table for us, okay? Because He has paid our sin debt. And if that's not a reason to rejoice, there's no reason to. So we, we are sent, we're sending the situation to feast, I mean, it's to celebrate. So, but they found it from God's Word. God says, wait a minute, wait a minute now. Right in this feast, I mean, you need to go back and do something. So what, what do they do? He says, well, we found it in the book that, that we need to dwell in feast. And in verse 15, or, or boost. And they that should publish and proclaim in all their cities and in Jerusalem, saying, Go forth into the mount and fetch olive branches and pine branches and myrtle branches and palm trees and branches of thick trees to make booths as it is written. And that was written in Leviticus 23. And what it is, God wanted the people to be reminded that they dwelled in booths. These little spirit, the the, the houses were, were such, they had flat roofs. Now, they had a nice place to live, but God says, I want you to get out of that, that sealed place of luxury. I want you to go up on your roof. 
and I want you to sit in that hut. I mean, be like us, maybe going to camp out somewhere, okay? I mean, I mean you don't have any, all the conveniences, but, but the purpose is that is to remind you, because this is what happened to Israel when they left Egypt. They were in bondage, and you remember God got them out of it. And I want you to know that God got, gets us out of bondage. He is a chain breaker. And so when we see that, we rejoice in that. So God says, I want you to remember that. When they're going to Succoth, you remember that God had them dwell in booths. But God was there with them. So, so the point that I want to make is, and I think it would be a lesson for us, is that God said, you remember, really it's important to God that we remember where God has brought us from. Okay, And to do that, sometimes we have to live in inconvenient ways. And I think, in my little mind, that we can relate being sheltered in. I know it's a small way. you got to stretch a little bit to, to living in booths, okay? That's what he said. He said, you live in booths. You go to those places that, that's not going to be inconvenient, but because it shows us how fragile life is. What is that saying, you know, years ago to show up, uh, life is fragile, handle with prayer. I mean... I imagine there's more prayers been prayed in the last 30 days in a long, long time. And I pray that we'll continue to pray. You understand the fragility of life and how much we really depend on God. Hey, I don't need to tell you how much life changed. I never expected this to happen. Did you? I mean, can you see the world today? I mean, I can't believe it. I can't believe that something would come that could shut the church down, that could cause the stock market and the world to just falter. I mean, I, I remember going in grocery stores and seeing the frustrated, even fearful look on people's, people's faces when the shelves were empty. And they were looking for more than toilet paper, too. I mean, they were looking for food and, and, and things that, that really matter. So, so anyway, that's what God said to do. And they, they found it, though, written in the book. See, they didn't ask for opinions. They didn't say, well, you know, this doesn't apply to our life today. You know, it's so sad that so much of religion today and, and theology and church is about, well, you know, we can change this. We, it doesn't really matter how you live because that, that's, that, that didn't apply, don't apply to us today. I really heard that. It ought not to be. So, but they looked at what God said a long, long time ago. I tell you, the old past, don't get, get away from that. That is the meat of God and what God has called us. So in verse 16, so the people went forth and brought them, I want you to see obedience here, and made themselves booths, every one upon the roof of the house and in their courts, and in the courts of the house of God, and in the street to the water gate, and in the street of the gate of Ephraim. They did it. It might have been inconvenience, might not have made sense, but they did it. And so what is the results of that? I'm going to tell you what the results. Revival. When you obey God, you're going to have riches of revival in your heart. You're going to have joy. You know, if we're not obeying God, we're not going to be so joyful. We might cover it up sometime, but that's the only way we're going to find joy. It's, it's really obeying God. And then verse 17, all the congregation of them that were come again out of the captivity made booths and sat under the booths, for since the days of Joshua... The son of Nun, until that day, had not the children of Israel done so. And there was very great gladness. That's revival. So this hadn't been done for a long, long time. But, but that doesn't mean it doesn't need to be done. You know, I, I think what's happening in our world today, we say, well, you know, I haven't been living like this. You know, I haven't been sitting down with my family at night and, and eating dinner. Uh, I, I've been so busy, you know, I, uh, I, I haven't been doing this, that, and the other. I, I've noticed that, you know, in my little life. I, I, and wh what do we need to do? Well, we need, we'd see the, the merit of it. God says, God's going to remind us. You know, you know, sometimes, sometimes we can't glorify God to God kills the glory in us, okay? God has to kill that glory in us. And God knows how to do that because he can humble us. Now, we ought to humble ourselves, but God can humble us, and that's often more severe. So as we see this lesson today, I want us to look, up, first of all, this point of instructions. I want you to see that God has given us clear instruction. I want you to see God's book as a book that gives us instructions. 
You know, it's just like this. If this is in the Bible, this is what we ought to do, okay? It is written. That's what Jesus said when Satan tempted him in the wilderness. And that's what you and I need to say when Satan tempts us in our homes and our work and where we go. That's what God says. Now, we need this lesson of instruction. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, please. Turn there with me. This is some familiar verses too. But it relates back to this very reason. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the Bible says in verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant. I want you to know something. That's what God says. How that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Talking about this episode of the journey uh, from bondage by Israel. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all did eat the same spiritual meat and all did drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock and that rock followed them and that rock was Christ. He's still the rock that we follow, the rock that we stand on. And but with many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Here's the instructions. God says, don't do it. You know, I learn from my mistakes. I hope I do anyway. I mean, you know, we all make mistakes. But now when we start making them two or three times, then we got to really understand where's going, where we're going with this. See, the God gives us trust. See, don't do it. You know, Jesus Christ, 1 John tells us, in chapter 2, he says, my little children, I'm have you not sin. You know, the way we keep from sinning is follow God's word. This word is perfect. It's inspired by God. And there'll never be any more Bible. But he says there, don't do it. Try not to. But says, if you do, and we do, by the way, we can't keep God's word perfectly. We want to love God more, but we don't as we should. We to love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we don't do it. I don't do it. I want to. And I know you do. But he says, we have an advocate, he says that in 1 John 2, and that's Jesus Christ. But he says, I'm giving you instructions, and he says, neither be ye idolatrous, as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drank and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, for our learning, for our instruction, um, upon whom the ends of the world have come. So God, God gives us his word. His word is instruction. David said, Thy word, O Lord, have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. So we need to see God's Word, see the instruction. That's the riches of revival. And they see this, and they look at this, and this is what God said do. Years and years ago, but they said, we found it, and we're going to do it. And, and it, it applies to us today. And so how do, what does that mean to us? Well, I think it means in this pandemic era that we're living in, I thank God, maybe he's had to force us to do it, but we need to thank him for it and see the riches of revival in it. That God, you've made me realize just how much I depend on you. God, you've made me realize how this world is not something that I'm to put all my stakes in. That this, this world, this life that we're living can change, oh God. And so I need your instruction and I pray that God would help us to do that and, and bless us. You know, revival and the riches of it will always God's word will be central if you're going to have a true revival you're going to have the word of God Josiah you remember the young king Josiah Josiah found the book of God it was brought to him and it created a great revival I believe this I believe there's more interest in the word of God today than I ever noticed in my life I have been talking to people about the word of God they just bring it right up okay I believe that you see it on the internet. And I believe God is sending out his word in a way. And if he had to close down the church to do it because we hadn't been faithful in getting out his word, then he's going to put it on the internet. He's going to put it on the YouTube. He's going to put it wherever it means because God says, my word will not come back void. God is serious and we ought to be serious too. And we have instructions from God. And so first of all, see the instruction that they, these people noticed and how revival was the results of it. And I pray that we as a church will always use God's word 
And I believe we're doing this. And I appreciate the organization of the church and the articles of faith and things that are built on God's Word, not the opinion of man. Okay, now let's look at inconvenience. Inconvenience. Uh, now, here's the thing I want to say about that. These booths were certainly inconvenient. But remember, we started off with a feast of tabernacles. But, well, gosh, I bet you didn't think you'd come to church the first time the doors are open publicly in a, in a couple of months and have to read from the book of Leviticus. But maybe you're just that hungry for the Word of God. <laughs> look at chapter 23, the book, book of Levit Leviticus. I bet we don't go there enough. I know I don't. Here's, here's the setting of this. This is where they get this from, Leviticus. Whatever you do in life, if you don't get it from God, you don't need to get it. You need to let it go, okay? And Leviticus chapter 23, verse 26, And the Lord spake to Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day of the seventh month, this is the, the uh, building up to the Feast of Time, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your soul. All right, now look down at um, verse 34. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this, uh, the fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be the feast of tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. And then, and then you go on, if you're still in that chapter with me, take um, verse 39 and also, on this fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. On the first day sh shall be Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be Sabbath. And you shall take you the first day the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, and the boughs of thick trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your seven days. God seven. All right, here's what he's, what he's talking about. So we see the Day of Atonement, three events. This is the inconvenience. That comes before the Feast of Tabernacles. Day of Atonement, what is that? That's the day, the holy day, the priest, the Holy of Holies, goes in the Holy of Holies and makes an offering for our sins. See, we need to see that's what revival is. Revival is understanding Jesus Christ. Now, He is our high priest. And that's exactly what He did for us on the cross of Calvary. He made an offering. Now, He's talking about, and we didn't read it all, but if you read that Leviticus uh, when he's talking about the Day of Atonement, afflict your souls. There's a mourning that comes before the rejoicing, that comes before the feast to understand that, that we're sinners and that we, we deal with God only through the mercy of His substitutionary act that He gives us in Christ. What a blessing that is. Did you know that mercy, the mercy of God, we all cry for mercy, but where does that come from? It comes because His justice has been satisfied. You see, God could not enable His mercy to take hold of us had it not been His justice satisfied because God is perfectly balanced, see? But so what happens, He gives us Jesus, and that makes it perfectly balanced, you see? That's what the day of atonement, see, what happened, the priest, the, every person from, from sun up to sundown, I've, I've read and, and understand that sacrifices were made. Uh, if you had a lot of money, you, you know, you, you, had, you had to bring a bullock. Uh, if, you had a, if you had a kind of a mid uh, income, you brought a, a sheep or a goat. If you were really poor, you brought a turtle dove or a pigeon. I mean, you know, it, it was just related to what, it, what you could afford, but you brought it. And you made an offering for your sin. That animal was killed, and the priest then would sprinkle that blood on the altar. And that was to represent forgiveness of sins. Because... You and my sins will not be forgiven without the shedding of blood. God says very clearly, without the shedding of blood, there will be no remission of sin. My goodness, that's what the Day of Atonement is. It's understanding that Jesus died for our sins. You know what? That overshadows any pandemic or any virus or any problem we think we've got. When we understand what Jesus Christ has done for our sins, that He has did them away, and then not only that, he, he, the blood was sprinkled, then the, they would take a goat up to Jerusalem to the Mount of Olives and, and lead him out, a fit person the Bible describes, led this goat out into the wilderness and just turned him loose. It was a scapegoat, they called it. That, that meant, he just turned him loose, that his sins were gone. That the sins uh, that represented 
that the people committed were on that scapegoat and they turned him loose. It, and that's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was crucified outside the gate among the thieves, you see. So when the goat was gone, the sins were gone. So the day of atonement should bring us revival and understanding. We remember that, that gosh, my sins are gone, all of them. I don't have any. They're gone. I mean, what, what? Can you believe that? <laughs> I mean, that's revival. That is rejoicing. I mean, you know, that will motivate us. I mean, you know what? It'll make us want to obey God. Don't tell me that, that obedience is legalism. Obedience is the result of salvation. That's what obedience is about. And we need to thank God that he's given us this joint rejoicing, that he's given us that we depend on him. But, oh, my goodness, we can neglect that. So what God is saying he says, I want, you to, I want you to afflict your souls. I want you to then, I just, you go to the feast, but then you build the booth. You remember what I've done for you. How, you. how the inconvenience of your life makes it manifest what I've done for you and how many blessings that we have because of God. You know, there's, there's a time, and this is, what, this is what the riches of revival are about. Sure, we... We probably have realized, you know, life doesn't always go like we want it. I mean, I mean, there's some tough, tough things you have to deal with in life. But, but you know, when you think about it, we, we, need to, we need to take the time sometime to just let it all get. We just need to cry out to God. We just need to weep and, and remorse and say, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. I wish it had been different with this and that to happen. But then there's a time we need to wash our face and we need to embrace the life that God has given us. And that's what I believe that we need to do as a church, we need to do as a family, we need to do as people of God. We say, God, thank you, God. I'm going to embrace this life you've given me. Uh, because you know what? We need to be mindful that we're living in the best opportunity that I can ever imagine to proclaim the Word of God. Because here's the thing you've got to be careful of. I believe right now that the truth of God has become the new hate speech as far as the world goes. You start telling people the truth. You start telling people what God says. I'm going to tell you what. You're going to be labeled an infidel. You're going to be labeled narrow-minded. I'm going to tell you. It's just the way the world is. But that's what God says. God, we're to follow God, and we're to follow him even when it's inconvenient. You know, God didn't say to Jonah, did he? Jonah, I want you to go down to uh, Joppa. Or I want you to go... Uh, to preach to the Ninevites, if it's convenient. When it's convenient for you, would you do it? God didn't say that. Job wanted, uh, jo Jonah wanted to be a little more convenient. God's not going to tell us now, Randy, I want you to preach just when it's convenient. No, he says, you preach whether you feel like it or not, in season, out of season. But you preach the Word of God, the truth of God. God doesn't say for you and me. Now, I'm going to tell you what you do. Would you please pray when, you, when it's convenient? God says you pray without ceasing. That's what God says. And you know what? So many times, groanings that cannot even be uttered. You ever tried to pray and you really couldn't say the words? I mean, you didn't know what to say? You know what? That's the very prayers that God answers most of the time, I believe. I mean, that's what God sees in our heart. And what a blessing that is to understand that. So we have instructions. We have inconvenience. Right here in this book. Now, as you go back to Nehemiah, we see in chapter 8, also the interest, thirdly and lastly, the interest that was generated when we see these people finding the Word of God. See, this is a leading book. Find the Word of God. What does God say? And believe it. And you trust him. And then, because you know what God says about his word? It's how we fear the Lord. What they were doing, were saying in Deuteronomy, you remember Deuteronomy 6, I think it is. God says that, that we're to take the word of God. He says this to the head of the house. He says, you, you take the word of God and you teach it when you're standing up and sitting down and laying down. A, I might be paraphrasing some of that, of course. But he says, you put it around you. And you hang it up as frontness upon you. And so what God is saying, my word is, is indicative of your reverence for me. And it brings us to understand the fear, the, the holy fear of God of understanding who God is. Because we understand God is holy. 
and he's given us word, and he's given us his word to bless us and to keep us close to him. And he is our manufacturer. And, you know, we need those instructions because this book is a manufacturer's handbook. Now, probably, and I can say this because my wife is not here, maybe I would probably say it anyway, but probably one of the greatest testings we've ever had in our marriage, Penny and I, is years and years ago on Christmas Eve. And I would already go to bed, and Penny would wake me up about 12, 30, or 1 o'clock, and said, Randy, get up. We got to put these, stuff, these things together. You know, we we're going to help Santa, okay? So I would get up, and we would go over to my little office, and she'd have these things laid out, and I didn't feel like doing it, okay? And so what I didn't want to do, you ever tried to put together a, you know, you get these, a bicycle or a Nintendo or whatever it might be, and you got to put it together, you know? And I don't want to read the instructions. And I'd try to start on it, you know, and finally, the way we worked our issue out, Penny would get the instructions and lay them out and tell me each step to take. You do this, Randy. Put this up. This nose next. And it made me feel better. But as I get older, i gotta, I got to relate. I'm not too humble or ashamed to tell you. I have got to where I read instructions a lot closer now. And you and I need to read instructions about this book. I'm sure Jonathan and Elizabeth, this book has instructions on marriage. You know that? And what a blessing. What a blessing it is. God doesn't send us. You know, He gives us instructions. The problem is, you know, we, we don't feel like that. We don't understand that. So, so then, but the interest, that's where I was going. How interested are we in God? You know, when you find God's Word, when you understand through the in inconvenience that we go to, we know that God, we can depend on Him. We trust Him and we know how fleeting the other things in life may be. But you know, God will never leave us nor forsake us. He won't. He's, he's a gracious, holy God. And you know, sometimes, here's the thing that's sort of a paradox. I've said over and over again how Christianity is such a paradox. We don't really see the merit and the honor of the church, of religion, until we get outside of it. And to me, that's one of the great blessings of this sheltering in, if we can say that. Because, because now we see, at least I feel like I see, and I think you do, the more importance of what worship is about. I mean, we can get so involved in the organization of it all that we miss God in it all. But so what God is saying, you get in those booths, you get inconvenienced, and then you're going to get more interest in God. I mean, you know, I'm sure, um, only by God's mercy, I'm not there yet. I'm sure, though, when I'm laying in the bed of a hospital, I can have a lot more interest in what I need to be doing at home than I do now instead of complaining about, you know, it's too hot or it's too cold or too long or too short, you know? We need to see that and bless God. But these people, they rejoiced, and the Bible says, and there was a great gladness. And in verse 18 of Nehemiah 8, and also day by day from the first day into the last day, he read in the book of the law of God, and they kept the feast seven days, and on the eighth day was a solemn assembly according unto the manner of God. So what a blessing to rejoice in God. Um, to see that we have a God that is so faithful. I want to I wanna close. i got five minutes, but I wanted to show you. It, it really jumped on me, and it probably ought to be a whole sermon, but I, I, won't, I promise you I'll say that in just a minute. Look at Hosea 6, verse 1, because I think it kind of closes the riches of revival, and it kind of gives us some exposure to what we've experienced. Hosea 6, verse 1, come, God is calling us. He's a unity God. And we see from Nehemiah, they start off gathering together. And that's what church is about, the local church, when we gather together. Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. Now notice with me this verse, and, I, and, and I'm not going to elaborate on it, but God has given us this end to tell you, let's, let's come. Return to God. You know, we get in that far country. That far country like that prodigal son. 
You know what the far country is? The far country could be the lust of our minds and heart. The far country could be a very uncontrollable high temper too. I could be a far, I'd put you in a far country. Far country could be you just so much to do in your life. You've got so many things before you and God. You've got so many irons in the fire. You're in the far country. But so when that guy, out of God's grace, the prodigal understood he was in a far country, he comes to God. And he returns, and God is meeting him, and he's doing it with open arms. He says, return, let us return unto God, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. You know, we need to say in closing, God is near. God wants us to be reminded that he's near. If it takes Booth to do that, it takes a pandemic to do that, God says, don't you ever forget that I'm near. Don't you let anything come between me and you. God says, God is near, okay? But we need to understand, secondly, that God is kind. See, God does some surgery here, according to this verse in Hosea. He tears, but he will heal. God, you see, a clean wound will heal. It might leave a scar, but it will heal. So we don't need to have bitterness. That's where the infection gets in. We need to just surrender to God and give it, and God was healed. And you know what? Then God is unlimited what he, he will do. You know, I, I found a little poem. I can't really quote it all. It says, absolutely, absolutely tender, absolutely true. Understanding all things, understanding you. Infinitely loving, exquisitely near. That's God, our Father. What have we to fear? Isn't that a blessing? Isn't that a blessing to understand that? What a joy. May the Lord bless you. Would you join with me as we close in prayer? Most precious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Word of God. We thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit's impressing men to write it. We believe it's true, oh God, and we ask you to help us live it. We know we need your grace to guide us through it. We know, Lord, how we're so prone to stray away. We think our opinions are so good sometimes or those of others. Help us always, Lord, to measure our life by your word. We pray, O oh Lord, that inconveniences that you send our way would only remind us of how blessed and comforting you are. If it takes making us uncomfortable to make us comfortable in you, O oh God, then so be it. Just give us grace and mercy to be faithful to you and to be good witnesses of your amazing grace. And we pray, O oh Lord, that we would have a kindled reinterest, a more passion for you. Bless, O oh God. We need to be motivated. And you're going to have to do it and help us. Help us, O oh Lord, to always be excited about God. Nothing about you is boring, Heavenly Father. We thank you for this day that you've given us, for your forgiveness, for the day of atonement in Christ, our Lord, who made that sacrifice for us that we don't make any more. And help us, O oh Lord, now to be servants to you, to bless your holy name in every way. Thank you, Lord, for loving us and all that you do for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.